Okay, so um, great. Thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for being more interested in uh, landslides and couches than Elasticsearch. Um, I'm Mike Wallace, a research assistant at the University of Bristol. Um, the basis this is a talk on um, a collaboration between the particle physics department and the geographical sciences department, where we're improving the scalability of landslide modelling software and um, solving the associated data management problems. Um, basically, the first three items are kind of background, um, so do a bit of motivation, why we actually care about landslide modelling in the first place, um, and then why particle physics are involved. Um, was everybody at the previous talk on uh, Couchbase? Was anybody not at the talk on Couchbase? I'll, cut, I'll briefly mention CouchDB, um, do a short introduction to Big Couch, although there's a talk by Tim Anglade later where he'll be going into that in more detail. And then I'll go into what we're actually doing um, with a bit of architecture performance tests and then cover some related work. So, landslides. Um, this is just a few pictures of uh, kind of landslide um, devastation. Um, there's kind of the direct, the direct problems of um, like loss of human life, um, loss of homes and livelihood. And then there's kind of the less obvious problems that um, you get due to clear up costs, um, repairs to um, roads and critical infrastructure, and the cost of disruption um, whilst your critical infrastructure is um, unavailable because it's been temporarily blocked or destroyed. Um, roads in particular are very important um, because people like the uh, emergency services need to get around and given that landslides are usually caused by a trigger event such as a tropical storm, um, people really, really need to get around. Um, people need to be get to hospital, people need to go and fix power stations and other things and landslides really, really mess that up. Um, it's generally worse in developing countries. Um, Partly because there's just generally less resources to manage the problem. Um, and another problem is just is due to kind of development schemes. Um, so the World Bank might loan might loan a country some money to fund a development programme and then um, maybe best practice doesn't get followed in that development programme, so risk accumulates and then you get um, you, know, you get landslides and then you need more more, more money to uh, deal with the consequences of that. Um, and as well as being more, as well as the cost being more in general, um, the other problem is that um, developing countries tend to have a much smaller gross domestic product. So the cost in relation to that is much more significant. So it's a problem that, um, although they're kind of small scale in terms of disasters, um, you can actually do a lot of good if you uh, if you can tackle them. Um, so it's kind of hinted at earlier, but it's very important, so it's in big. Um, indirect costs are orders of magnitude higher than direct costs. Um, so whilst your clean up and repair costs are high, um, whilst that's going on, you're racking up exponentially higher indirect costs. Um, and that implies that if you reduce your clear up and repair times, you can massively reduce the overall costs of um, landslide events. Um, and that's one of the things that disaster response planners want to do. Um, and if you're into disaster planning, um, it's much more complicated than this, but basically you want to know the risk, and that's a function of hazard, which is the probability of a, an event, the exposure, which is who or what is affected, and the vulnerability, which is how much it's affected, so it can be unaffected or completely destroyed. Um, so you want to know things like um, how big is the landslide going to be, and what's the economic impact of the landslide of that magnitude. So, um, knowing that, you can then make, you can kind of do mitigation, um, such as moving, uh, you can move clear up equipment to strategic locations before a given storm is going to hit, um, or you can actually make preventative measures on the slopes, so you could cut them back, you could put reinforcements in. Um, and if you, if you can calculate things like risk, then and costs, you can work out where um, the most useful place to kind of invest your resources are. Um, so you want to make sure that if you're spending $50,000 um, on cutting back a slope, that that's going to save you more than $50,000 in, in terms of um, cost when a disaster happens. Um, and of course, all of these things, if you've got 
adequate um, if you've got suitably clever modelling, you can figure these things out. And that's where landslide modelling comes in. Um, so the University of Bristol has world-leading landslide modellers. I'm not one of them. I'm just a software developer. Um, but they, they develop two products which are used by the World Bank and governments and also by industry. CASM is a physical, it's a physically based model of slope hydrology and stability. And Questor is um, an economic model that can calculate exposure, vulnerability, and overall risk. So Chasm feeds into Questor, although you can use Chasm on its own, and people do that quite frequently. Um, and they use it in uh, this kind of the general workflow. Um, so field engineers who are local to wherever the wherever the problems are will go out and they'll take soil samples and they'll they'll measure things um, such as where the water table is. Um, what the slope angles are, and um, what vegetation is around. And that all goes back to Bristol where it gets validated by geographical sciences people, and then the simulation runs locally, and then somehow the results have to get back to the people who actually make the decisions and can benefit from them. Um, and that all works fine, um, but you can only really do one situation at a time. Um, So um, when people are kind of making these kind of decisions, they, they don't just want to say, well, if, it's, if the storm is this size um, and I do this as a slope, what happens? You want to evaluate a number of different um, scenarios at the same time. Um, so you might want to look at, say, 20 different slope angles and work out wh you know, where's the most effective, how much do we cut it back by, um, how much do I need to do that to reduce the risk? Um, and another source of complexity is um, stochastic simulation. So things that are quite hard to measure using the survey equipment that's available, like soil saturation, um, that gets defined as it gets defined as a mean and a standard deviation, and then the simulation gets run repeatedly with um, those that parameter generated stochastically. So you go from a situation like this, where you have one slope, one parameter, no stochastic parameters, so you get one file and it takes a quarter of an hour to run, that's great. Um, you start looking at different cut slope angles, you've now got 25 files and your runtime is six hours. Um, it gets worse when you add stochastic parameters in, um, and then when you start looking at multiple slopes, um, you're looking at about four years of CPU time. and. Um, quite a lot of output files, which um, you're not going to you're not going to be able to analyze those by um, opening them up in Excel, um, which is kind of how things are done at the minute. Um, so, how can we how can we deal with these things? Um, obviously, there's um, parallel execution, um, so we can do a fairly dumb parallelization and just run run the job with different parameters on as many worker nodes as possible and then get the results back. Um, and um, we, we also need to kind of manage the amount of data that's generated. So each run would be maybe a few tens of gigabytes, but you'll have quite a lot of result sets um, and you need to manage that volume of data. Um, and that, at the minute, that's kind of tens of terabytes for a year, which is probably puts us somewhere in, in terms of big data, we're probably leprechauns, um, but there are no facilities for managing that data. Um, and the other problem is that um, because landslides are triggered by tropical storms, tropical storms tend to destroy telecommunications in infrastructure, which in terms of partition tolerance, I mean, that's a big partitioning event. Um, so we need to be able to make sure that users still have their data in the event of extreme network partitions. Um, so basically, we want parallelization, we want long-term storage, we want queryable results, and we want offline access. There are a lot of other things, but those are the those are the key ones. Um, particle physics come into this because they've been dealing with scalability for years. Um, they generate um, with the particle collider like the LHC. They generate about 15 petabytes a year, um, and they've They've spent the best part of 15 to 20 years um, kind of working out how best to store and analyze all this data. Um, 
and for anyone familiar with kind of um, big data in academia, um, the approach is kind of grid computing. Um, so the particle physicists have the worldwide LHC computing grid, um, and that lets the various organisations involved in the experiment share their compute resources, um, which so both storage and power. And then all the physicists involved in the elaboration can perform their analysis on petabytes of data. Um, it sounds simple, um, it's horrendously complicated. Um, so a, a small aside on grid computing, just for if anyone is unfamiliar with it. Um, you tend to have a bunch of heterogeneous resources um, and um, you have kind of each each kind of data center would have its own resource manager or its own storage, and you have brokers that match kind of jobs to resources. Um, compared to a batch system, it's interorganizational, so many different administrative domains. Um, the resources, uh, worker nodes in one organization are going to be different to worker nodes in another. Um, the, it's all connected via an kind of open internet connection, so it's relatively hostile and because your data centers are globally distributed, things like support become an issue because when, it, when you're running jobs in the day, there may not be anybody uh, where you're getting problems to fix them. Um, as, as opposed to infrastructure as a service type cloud computing, um, which you can draw similarities with, grid computing tends to be a, a walled garden. So it's, they, they're set up to provide kind of resources for people working towards a common goal or and it, it can be quite difficult to get access. You can't just give a credit card number and, and run jobs. It's kind of much more complicated. Um, and obviously you need to purchase hardware up front. Um, the user interfaces tend to, be, tend to require a lot of, um, a lot of expert knowledge. Um, so for most commercial applications, um, cloud utility computing tends to be a better fit. Um, so the thing that um, one of the things that lets you manage jobs on the grid is um, this thing called Dirac, which is a workload management system developed by um, physicists working on the LHC B experiment, um, and that will um, provide resource allocation, workload management. It uses GLite for kind of handling all the grid computing parts, um, but you can actually plug in various compute backends, including Amazon EC2 um, or Condor or various other back systems. So it's quite flexible. Um, it's also quite complex. Um, and the basic, well, the basic analysis workflow is something like that. Jobs go in, results come out. Um, and the physicist sits there, usually kind of submitting jobs from a Fortran common block or something. Um, and that, that works. Um, it's, yeah, it, it works. Um, so, I won't spend very long on CouchDB, um, but basically it's, um, it meets the requirements for um, offline storage and um, have the ability to survive um, extreme partitioning. Um, and also, um, Big Couch um, kind of meets the requirements for um, managing all the, well, storing all the data um, centrally as well. Um, so as, as it grows, um, as more people use it and more simulations get run, we would be able to scale across um, multiple nodes. Um, so everyone knows what CouchDB is? Yeah. Um, so basically it suits us um, because of the multi-master replication, the geo-indexing, um, and the ability to run it on phones, laptops, and servers and clusters. So a field engineer can go out with an Android handset, input data that can replicate back when a network connection is available, which is great. Um, and there's a few, few things that aren't so great. Storage, because you're storing entire JSON documents, you can burn up quite a lot of disk. Um, that will change in 1.2, I think, um, with the snappy compression patch that, yes. Um, and um, when you're dealing with a lot of writes, a lot of concurrent writes from a lot of different places, um, there's, I mean, there is a mechanism for doing bulk writes in CouchDB, but it requires, it requires you to have all your data in one place and then submit them through the bulk docs API. And when you've got jobs running on thousands of different nodes, you can't really do that. Um, 
you know, big, big couch. Um, if you want to know the technical details, then go and see Tim Anglade's talk at 20 past four. Um, this is just a very, very high level overview, but it's basically Dynamo influenced clustered couch DB. Um, so it has the read write quorum. Um, so you can kind of trade between availability and consistency depending on the needs of your application at a particular time. Um, so a, re a write operation with a co uh, quorum of two um, would do something like that, and a read do something like that. Um, I'm sure Tim will go into much more detail. <laughs> um, so in terms of consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, um, well, yes, you would choose two. With Big Couch, you can you can actually kind of change your trade-offs. So um, if you're if you use low values of R and W, then you're favouring availability over consistency. As they get higher, um, you, ha you can have read your writes consistency, but then if you lose a certain number of nodes, then you lose availability, so your availability is not so great. Um, and if you want full consistency, then yeah, you've got no availability in the event of partition tolerance. Um, so when you're using big couch, um, as opposed to regular CouchDB, um, rather than just plugging a regular couch-based application in, um, it's yeah. You, you do have to think a bit about um, how everything's going to operate on an eventually consistent cluster. Um, and then there's a few little things um, that are all documented in the in the docs, but they're just worth putting up. Um, bulk docs. Um, because bulk docs operates on one CouchDB um, instance, you can't have quorum values. Um, the changes feed, because it's a cluster, a distributed cluster, you can't really have global ordering. And when you cap, yeah, when you're querying views, the read quorum is one, because each view is calculated, right? Each shard, the view is it, the index is created for each shard, and then they're merged sorted together. So there is no read quorum. Um, so your views, unless your write value is um, the same as your number of replica replications, um, then your views won't um, have read your rights consistency. Um, and the other part of the couch puzzle is GeoCouch, which um, brings geo-indexing, um, which Dale mentioned in his talk, and obviously Volker's here. Um, but that gives us the ability to query um, mm -hmm. To, to ask questions like, you know, just within this area, what what is at most risk of failing, or what what failures are going to cost the most? Um, so obviously we need something like this, um, which doesn't exist, and I've been looking into doing over the last few days. Um, so that's something that um, we're planning to do, and if anyone would like to help, um, or if anyone also has a need for it, then that yeah, that would be great. Um, so, going back to um, what we're actually doing, um, after all that background, um, so we want, we want parallelism, um, so um, we can't really go to, um, I mean, the, one of the big consumers of the software is um, St. Lucia in the Eastern Caribbean. And it's not really feasible for us to go over there and just set up a, a thousand node batch compute farm and start running jobs. Um, it's, it's much more easier to, um, you know, it's much more practical to um, get access to some computing infrastructure remotely that somebody else is managing. Um, and it's not just, not just um, people out in uh, kind of remote locations, but also, um, there are other potential users, and they could all benefit from kind of you know, batch grid or cloud may may suit them depending on their circumstances. Um, so, fortunately, going back to Dirac, that supports those three um, different uh, kind of compute backends. Um, so, what we have is something like this, um, and Dirac's great, but it's not something you can just kind of hand to a geotechnical engineer and say, there you go, you can, you can run jobs now. Um, I mean, physicists spend you know, months of their time getting to grips with this stuff. 
um, and they're supposed to be you know, they're supposed to be good with computers and um, so we need some way of giving non-technical users access to the stuff um, so we need some kind of job manager some kind of high level job manager layer um, so obviously Dirac manages low level jobs and we need something that deals with taking general simulation requests um, and turning them into kind of discrete jobs um, and that can be uh, oh, that could be a um, a nice web interface um, rather than the command line or um, a bunch of Fortran code. Um, and then we go, yes, the storage requirements. Um, obviously, this is where um, having a database becomes useful. Um, and we can actually store executables, um, geographic data, and input and output data. Um, so the job manager would pick up new job requests from the database and then the jobs themselves write their output back. Um, and that's the other thing you need is um, the users need to have their own copy of the data um, so that they can survive, um, you know, they can still access the data in the event of network, um, you know, in the event of no network. Um, and that's where the uh, replication comes in. And obviously that's why CouchDB um, and the big couch incarnation of CouchDB are particularly suited to what we're doing. Um, so we end up with a system that's something like this. Um, basically, we have users, users over here. Um, they would create a JSON document locally that describes their simulation, and that would get replicated into big couch. And then a task sentinel picks that up. Um, for a simple simulation request, it wouldn't do anything other than just say, oh, this is now a job. Um, but if the user had requested various different angles of slope or various different rainfall scenarios, then it would generate a job for each of those scenarios. Um, and then write a job. Those jobs would get written back to the database. And then the job sentinel would pick up each of those jobs and submit them to Dirac. Um, the job submitter can actually, you can actually change where it submits to at um, configuration time, um, just because um, you know, if you did have some kind of local batch system, then um, you know, sometimes, sometimes it may not make sense to set up something like Dirac. Um, and then eventually your job run, your job finishes, it writes its output back. Um, and then there's a, a little thing which um, tracks the job status and marks task is closed when the job's finished. Um, so quick aside on the data model, um, the task request specifies the software release, um, the executable and the version, um, and it specifies the input files. So um, users would have a web interface that lets them view input data that's already been uploaded or add new input data, um, and then they can compose a job out of the input that's available and using the software that's available, and they would specify any extra variable parameters. Um, the job sentinel writes a job definition. Um, that again includes the release and input files and the s specific parameters that were generated by the task sentinel. Um, and then eventually a job somewhere lands on a worker node. Um, and in our case, a job is um, relatively short Python script, which it knows, its, it knows its identity, it doesn't really know anything else, so it goes back to Couch and downloads the job definition, from there it downloads the executable and the inputs and handles running um, and does some, you know, some uh, simple error corrections. Um, and then the other part is shows and views. Um, we, obviously CouchDB Everything that goes in is JSON. Um, this landslide modeling software likes to work with uh, flat text files. Um, so, nice thing about CouchDB is the um, the show functions where you can access a document, access a JSON document, and run it through any transform <coughs> function written in JavaScript. So, in our case, we map the JSON to the input format that. Um, the software expects. So we have to write a show function for every different type of input file. Um, and that's, that's important if 
if we wanted to reuse this with some different executable, um, like some uh, yeah, some kind of engineering modeling software or something, then you would need to write show functions for um, all the input files there, unless you could convince the developers to uh, accept JSON. Um, so going back to the architecture, um, obviously we've got big couch, um, which gives us a degree of availability and um, uh, partition tolerance. Um, the whole thing uh, isn't completely failure tolerant, but um, the Sentinels themselves are, they are light, very lightweight um, and they're stateless, so if they die, you can respawn them. <coughs> Whilst it's dead, that part of the system won't happen, but it doesn't bring anything else down, which is good. Um, Dirac, um, is, Dirac has a lot of um, job management, job failure recovery stuff built in. Um, so that will do its best to ensure that jobs, jobs that get run actually get run. Um, obviously, if a job, if you've got a bad job, then um, like that will eventually get killed by Dirac. Um, the load balancer that's currently um, Apache HTTPD, and there's no there's no high availability there at the minute. So future versions of this architecture will have um, some kind of failover there because that's kind of a very critical part of the system. Um, because if jobs can't write back after burning all the compute time, then that's quite wasteful. Um, so I mentioned um, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Um, in terms of um, the architecture, we're, we're querying Big Couch at various points. So the users, um, the sentinels, um, and the jobs themselves. Um, thank you. So uh, yeah, we, um, I'll just go through the, the various places where we've um, kind of made the trade-offs. So with the users, we, um, we obviously go for availability and partition tolerance, um, and we rely on the eventual consistency and the, the MVCC um, model that CouchDB provides to resolve any conflicts. Um, with the job output, um, it's much more important the job writes its output than the, the view of um, the job output. Um, or the view of all job outputs is consistent. So again, um, a low a low write quorum um, favoring availability would um, is kind of what we use there. Um, and then for the sentinels, this we we really would need you really need read your writes um, because um, if you're uh, if you don't have read your writes consistency, then you can end up querying for new jobs. You see a new job, you yeah, great. Um, I'll submit that job, I've submitted that job, give me a new job, and you'll get the same job back. Um, it's unlikely, but it does happen. Um, you know, it's, it, and it can happen, yeah, when it does happen, you're gonna end up um, you know, running unnecessary jobs. So read your rights is very important. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, because, because the view has an implicit um, value of an implicit R value of one, um, then we kind of have to use writes. We have to use um, very high W values. So the writes, um, we have to get consistency on the writes, which means that if we lose, if we even lose one node in the big couch cluster, um, although jobs can write and users can still access the cluster and submit jobs, the sentinels can't actually do anything with the jobs. Um, so you'd end up with a backlog. Um, and that's, yeah, that's that's not so great. Um, so yeah, we basically end up with something like this. There is no, yeah, there is no availability in the event of partition failure. Um, and that's that's okay. It just means you need to get you need to get your node back um, reasonably quickly. But the critical parts of the system are still going to work. Um, so yeah. I've been doing some tests over the last couple of weeks to see um, see whether we can support the kind of rights that we're expecting. Um, obviously, benchmarking um, is difficult, and I'm not claiming that these are generic benchmarks at all. They're very specific to what we're doing. In particular, um, 
Right, we're the, kind of doing a lot of concurrent writes to CouchDB um, is it's not something that um, you would normally normally be trying to do. Um, so yeah, be wary. Um, so um, I've looked at two two kind of potential crunch points um, in terms of database load, which is when a job um, when a job downloads its input and when a job uploads its output. The reason why they're particularly dangerous is because if you have a task that splits into a thousand jobs, then if all those jobs land on worker nodes simultaneously, then you're going to get a thousand queries back within a re reasonably short space of time. Um, so, yeah, this was done with um, with five clients um, firing uh, up to a thousand requests per second, um, and the test document was 104 kilobytes, and we ended up with something like this with regular CouchDB. Um, so the average latency is quite high. Um, well, for reads it's reasonable. For um, for output upload it gets quite high. Latency isn't really a big concern for the system side of what we're doing. Um, we can live with, yeah, you know, that we can live with reasonably high levels of latency. Um, but if you look at the um, response codes there with the writes, you start to get quite a lot of errors as um, as you go upwards of a thousand concurrent um, requests. Um, so um, similarly with Big Couch. Um, a one node big couch cluster, so not really a cluster. Um, so, yeah, add more nodes. Um, in theory, um, the writes are distributed across the nodes um, using a round robin load balancer, so you should start to see reduced latency and better errors. Um, and, yeah, it's, uh, it's not quite what you might expect to see. Um, and another problem kind of crops up with them. Um, 502 errors from the load balancer. Um, fortunately, it turned out that was due to keep alive connections, um, which with a RESTful database is not not something that you really need or want. Um, so if you eliminate those, your 502 errors disappear, but you start to get um, a bunch of status code zero returned, which is not even a valid status code. So that's not so great. Um, I did a few tests of three, five, and six node clusters. Um, we'll just look at writes, because um, I'm fairly pressed, fairly short for time. I'll be even short for time if it doesn't come up. Yeah, interesting. Be doing this all day to make sure I didn't get a spinning beach ball of death. Um, oh, well. Right, we'll give up on that. Um, anyway, the summary is uh, that I wasn't really seeing um, an improvement in latency or in um, error codes. Um, and that, was, that wasn't really what I was expecting to see. Um, but um, because, um, like because these machines only have one network interface and because um, the volume of writes was actually approaching, I mean, at a thousand writes, you start to approach a gigabit a second, so maybe there was some, some bottleneck there. It's, it's basically any, something that needs looking into. So first observation, yeah, benchmarking really is hard. You can't just run some tests and get some answers. Um, but one node, we, we're reasonably happy we can handle up to a thousand concurrent writes. Um, whilst all the errors that we saw were going on, um, Couch to be in Big Couch was still fine. They don't crash. Um, they'll still handle requests in the future, and that's good news because you can do you can do things like backing off and retrying when you've got jobs that are trying to access the database. Um, one interesting thing was sequential UUID generation. You sometimes get 409 conflicts, um, which I've not seen with random UUID generation, um, which um, is something to do with the way Big Couch um, kind of generates its sequential UIDs across the cluster. Um, it's not a problem that I've seen at anything other than reasonably high load. Um, 
So I think I've just got time to cover some related work. Um, there is um, a project called Management of Slope Stability in Communities and um, uh, another project um, which span off out of the Random Hacks of Kindness event. Um, and that's about generate building data entry and visualization tools for the um, Mosaic project. Um, so Mosaic is um, basically community-based landslide risk reduction. Um, it's kind of looking at low-cost solutions that you can do to improve, to decrease risk, um, such as improving drainage. And they also do things like provide field survey equipment to um, people in communities. They make heavy use of CASM already and will be using it a lot more um, when, when they can uh, run at a much higher scale. The Random Hacks of Kindness project, um, the winning project from Random Hacks of Kindness 1 was a standalone visualization data entry tools for CASM. Um, and that, we are hoping we can work to, to get that into, to make it interoperable with um, our platform. So there's um, two of the guys on the left of that picture, Brian and Jason, are still, they're, they're still involved in this project after the event. And um, they've been contributing a lot of good code at um, that repository. There's a couple of screenshots from the data entry um, part and uh, the visualization. Um, and a quick note on portability. Um, obviously, the framework is executable agnostic, so you can stick any executable in and you can scale it up, uh, apart from where it's not executable agnostic, which is um, generating input files data entry um, and doing anything useful with results. So there's those parts of the system you would need to, you'd need to extend to run with any software. Um, and that, you know, that kind of raises a question of is there an interest in wider use of doing this kind of thing um, using CouchDB as, a, as the core of a kind of workload management um, platform. Um, so summary, parallel execution of landslide modeling software is useful and it can be useful for other types of software. Performance testing is very important. If you do things that you would expect to increase performance, um, you really may not actually get those, those uh, expected improvements, so you, you really, really do need to test. And um, once I've got the initial prototype of this, um, I'm intending to get more involved with CouchDB, particularly with um, creating a geo-indexer for, well, porting the existing geo-indexer into Big Couch. Um, and looking at n-dimensional indexing. Um, there's just a few acknowledgements from the physics and geographical sciences input and the random hacks of kindness guys. And that's, that's it. So if anyone's got any questions, I'm sorry there's not much time, um, but fire away. Did you consider uh, using HDFS or something like that on the back end side? HDFS? Yeah, which is, uh, in my imagination, it's more mm. uh, appropriate for uh, large file processing and crunching. Yeah, I mean, if, if we were dealing with large files, then HDFS would be, would definitely be something we were, we were looking at. Um, the, the input data, I mean, the individual files tend to be quite small. Um, and what, the, what we're kind of doing is running running a lot of simulations on a slightly different set of, of small data rather than running kind of the, the sort of Hadoop style jobs where you're kind of doing um, analysis on a massive amount of data. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, if there are no other questions, then... Uh, that's copy time.